Good morning again. <laughs> I'm excited to be with you. I missed you last week. It was my niece's 30th birthday. My brother was making a big thing out of it. And I almost had no birthdays with her, so I felt I had to go down there. Um, plus, we're starting a new sermon series today called All In. You might have used those words to describe something else you were doing in your life, maybe a few different times. I know I did. Uh, music, obviously. But um, I like to play pool, too. Do we have any pool players here? Okay. <laughs> Middle row pool hall. Late teenager into the 20s, I would be down there all the time. I had my own pool stick, so, oof, you know, um, that was a thing. And um, there was an old guy that used to come into pool hall, probably my age now, but I was in my 20s. And we all, we all called him Pop, and he worked down the Kingsburg Boat Yards. I don't know if he was repairing boats, whatever he was doing, but he was an amazing pool player. And he could beat everybody that was there. And he just took a liking to me. He goes, hey, Chuck, I'd like to teach you the game. And I was humble. I was like, yeah, you're much more advanced than I am. And he goes, when I'm here, just play with me. And he taught me how to do a lot of, put a lot of English on the ball and how to shoot off a bank. And he taught me all the little tricks. Um, but then the pool hall got sold and Bucky came in. But Bucky was a lot more professional. He redid the tables and he tightened the pockets so the ball couldn't just roll in. You had to hit it dead center. Um, and then he started the 25 club. And that was if you ran 25 balls, you got your name on the wall in the 25 club plaque. And because I was mentored by Pop, Pastor Chuck did a 28, 29 ball. So I was part of the 25 club. So I'm thinking I'm pretty cool. <laughs> Until a guy named Willie Marsconi walked in. And if you don't know who he is, he was a men's world champion 15 times from 1941 to 1957. I think this was around the 70s sometime. Um, and he came to do a mini exhibition, I guess. And he just walked in and he goes, well, we all knew he was coming. And he said, I'm going to run 150 balls. And I'm going to lay the stick down. So I was like, I had a chair like this. I had a bird's eye view of the table. And I just watched this man. That's for 10 racks. You know, he just a master of the pool, wherever, the, wherever he wanted the ball to go, and then he would set up for another break shot. He was incredible. And then he just got 150, and it was effortless, and he put the stick down. Well, I did a little bit of digging on him, too, so I found out that in a professional exhibition match, he actually ran 562 balls. That's 37 racks. I mean, that's... <laughs> That's somebody that's all in, you know, and he had the skill set to prove it. He had a gift and he had the skill set. And I can only imagine the countless hours that this guy practiced. And I know it costs something to do that. If you're going to become a champion, uh, you're letting go of other things in your life. But I think what it really means is that you don't stop short or walk away when things get tough. You stick it out, you know, and it's about giving all to everything you've got, especially with what God has called us to do. So, you know, I'm also very aware of self-care. You have to <laughs> uh, maintain some health there so you're more effective when you're going in and going out. But again, the real point I want to make is you don't stop short or walk away when things get tough. And you don't let people move you either. I've had people try to move me out of my ministry, out of certain parts of ministry I was doing. And there's times you've got to stand your ground. You don't have to get crazy or get nuts with people, but you don't have to be nasty, but you do have to stand your ground sometime. It's about giving all to and everything you got to whatever you're doing. That principle is absolutely paramount when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, you can expect opposition when you follow Christ. We talked about that. And you can have as much God as you want. You know, a lot, a lot of us are used to religion. We came out of a church that was religious, you know, and so sometimes I'm talking about this relationship with Jesus. We don't quite get it, but that's the most important thing going. Essentially, for me, what it means is I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible lays out for us the best way to live, to do life here on earth. And that's what Jesus calls abundant life in John 10.10, 10. and he actually uses that phrase. Let's look at it. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Whoa. And I'll tell you how he does that later. Uh, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. So in the message translation, it'll say more and better life than you ever dreamed of. So if we want to experience abundant life and even eternal life, and we'll talk about that during the series, um, we have to commit our lives to Jesus Christ. And again, we're being guided and directed by the Holy Spirit all along the way which I call our personal mentor. 
This means that to go all in, we're, we want to live like him, and I want to live for him. We kind of become, this might sound corny, but I mean it, uh, with the regeneration thing, the Imago Dei, we become little Jesuses. The, the nature's changed, the mainspring gets changed. So that's the heartbeat behind the series, and I want to get started with a word of prayer before we completely dive in. So let's bow our hearts. Lord, I confess the blindness of my understanding at times, and I can be pretty stubborn too, the stubbornness of my will and the foolishness of my thought life. And yeah, the addiction of my heart to things of this world. I mean, we are just full of sin, but you are so full of grace and truth. And without that grace, we are lost. So I praise you that in Christ, your grace abounds to us. Please open up our hearts today that we receive the truth of your word. Okay, so to begin with, I want to share one of the verses we'll be using for the next few weeks. It's kind of like three bullet points. You might want to call them three commands. I call them bullet points. But Jesus is speaking to his disciples, who are his earliest followers. And he says this in Matthew 16. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, let him take up his cross, and follow me. That kind of sounds like a lot to swallow, doesn't it? That's a lot there. But for the next few weeks, we're going to use that verse as a launch point for what I believe God will speak to us about following Jesus as best we can. So for today, I just want to focus on the first part, deny yourself, which is completely counterintuitive when you think about it. If you go to a therapist, uh, they're going to tell, well, let's talk about you, <laughs> you know, and what happened in your child life, and what happened with your dad, and what happened with your mom, and it's all about you. And in this culture, remember your first selfie stick? They look like antennas from the old antennas from a car. You'd pull it out, and you put the phone in, it, and then you put a little thing there, and you had a button on there, twink. Uh, but they've evolved. <laughs> now it's... Um, you open it up, and it's got a tripod on the bottom. It's got a Bluetooth, so you can work it, and it'll follow you all around. And then if you want to get really crazy, the top folds down like that, and you got two halo lights uh, that are LEDs that make you look completely outrageous. And we all have our social media pages. And, you know, I mean, it says, in the end times, men will be lovers of themselves. And that's generic, ladies. Um, it tells us to put other people first. And here we are. I mean... And the teenagers today are digital natives, and some of them are making incredible amounts of money because they're content creators or they're uh, influencers. Some of them are making $500,000 a month because of the internet, boom, blowing it all over the place. And I'm not talking porn or anything like that. I'm just talking kids on social media pages that are content creators that have a couple of million followers. Um, so this culture, <laughs> doesn't subscribe to us denying ourselves at all. That's what I mean about being counterintuitive. So that doesn't also mean that I mope around, I don't have any fun. You know, I mean, we're made to enjoy life. And in Psalm 24, just to get a little grounding, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So that's the ultimate reality to me. And he's given us a tough command, again, counterintuitive, but... If you're able to live it out, everything can change. And the question we're trying to answer today is, so what does it really mean to deny ourselves? Now, that's the million-dollar question. So I think it starts with taking a look inside, number one, looking introspectively. Um, prior to Jesus coming on earth, we had the Old Testament. And we read about what happened before the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And uh, that was his entrance into humanity. And one of the key things was that God communicates with certain people rather than everybody as a whole. And for instance, God will raise up leaders that he talks with on behalf of his people, Israel. One of those leaders was David. And David was a man of God who seeks to do things God's way as much as possible. And at one point, he becomes king over all Israel. That was like 20, 21 or 22 years after Samuel anointed him to be king. And it wasn't an easy ride. Saul was running around trying to kill him. You know, I mean, it was very tough before that. But when we look at the Old Testament, however, we don't just read about David. We see things that David wrote, and they can be found in the Psalms. So Psalm 139, 23, and 24 
David's talking to God, and he's going, search me, O God, and know my heart. Put me to the test and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any hurtful way in me and lead me in the way, in the everlasting way. When I was a new Christian and I read that, I was afraid to do that because I knew what was in me. You know, I was like, well, I'm going to ask God to look inside me, and I didn't realize he already knows everything. You know, and, But again, that could be considered a prayer. God, search me and know my heart. But David's doing something I think God wants all of us to do. Tell us the true story. You know, Paul said, I don't even judge myself. I don't trust myself to judge myself. I'll just rationalize everything. So if we hope to truly deny ourselves, as Christ says, we take an inward look, look introspectively. Uh, maybe that's something you've done before. I know a lot of you have. But the process of taking an inward glance and maybe ask yourself some questions. Um, where's my life heading? Or what are my priorities? And that, those questions have a tendency to reveal things to us. But even then, David wants God involved in the process. And so do I. Um, when I, I told you, my, when I prayed about the first and second touches, and I told you the first touch, I wouldn't even count my parents bringing me to church at that time, but I would count the first one is when I actually believed that God existed. And on the second one, before I got that second touch, I was broken and I was in pain. And in brokenness and pain, I just got down on my knees down the shore area where I lived. And I prayed and I just said, God, I need you to commit to my life and I need you to guide me where you want me to go. I need to reestablish the connection, all full bars, you know, and, and, and plant me firmly on the road that leads to everlasting life. That's kind of what David prayed. But that's the first time I hit bottom like that, and I asked him to come into my life. Before, it was just all religion, you know. Um, I would read a lot, and I was praying scripture back to him. One of the things I always prayed was, he awakens me in the morning, and he gives me the tongue of the learned, that I might speak a word in season to those who are weary. And about 10 years later, I realized he answered that prayer for me. But the Holy Spirit guided me from there, and he'll guide us from there too orchestrating divine appointments and led me out of the area where I was living and placed me in the garden where he wanted me to grow in, to grow and to serve in. And I let go of things I was accumulating because I was building Club Chuck, you know, so I was building my kingdom at the time. You see, it would have been pointless for David to merely look within himself and try to figure out what needed to exit. I think he needed God to play a role in that, and I think we do too. In the same way, we have the Holy Spirit that helps us in that process of learning what's in our lives, but what needs to exit our lives, too. And here's what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit in John 16. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. The Holy Spirit's first office is to glorify Jesus Christ. But for us, he's a comforter, he's a counselor, he's your guide, the paraclete, meaning alongside of, and he leads us into all truths. And that's what God does. God's not an author of chaos, so he desires to lead us into all truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Free from all the things that ensnare us. So the Holy Spirit, if we allow him to, He's not going to force his way in. He'll lead us to the best way of doing life from the inside out. And I think that's why it's important that God plays a role in our personal inventory or introspection, whatever you want to call it. But at, that, at this stage, what is it that God wants to reveal to you about what's presently going on in your life? That's the relationship he wants to have with you. And that's the relationship I want to have with him. You know, I mean... My friend Joe Brennan would always say, check yourself before you wreck yourself. And I like that. <laughs> you know, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but maybe where? In your mind? When we saw the George Foreman movie, we learned that the biggest battle is in your mind. And I totally agree. Or it could be in your heart. And I'm not talking about the pump. I'm talking the seat of our emotions. But what's the steps that God wants you to take? And to know that first you have to have receptivity to receive them, meaning a teachable spirit. Right? A lot of times we're all blocked up and like, ah, you know, <laughs> but you got to cooperate with God. And then after we learn the truth about what's going on inside, 
then we have to be willing to give it to God and do the work that we have to do too. But I certainly want God involved in the process. That takes humility. Humble, right? You got to humble yourself. And this is the next step in denying ourselves. We cooperate with God. And then what? We live with open hands. Can everybody clench your fists like this? Can you all please do that for me? Grrr, right? Uh, this is the action when you open them slowly. That feels so good just doing that. That's the action God desires from his people when they're denying themselves. Just live open-handedly. You know, it's, I mean, it's tough to let go of things that you're holding on to so tightly. And we often mistake our desires for necessities. I know I certainly did. And we clutch them as if my life depended on, or, or this is who I am because I have this. Uh, <laughs> And there's nothing wrong with having things either. There's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with having things. I mean, Job was rich and so was Abraham. Richer than rich. They had a ton of money. So I don't know, but maybe you experienced some of what I'm saying in the past. Um, it's something that the people in Jesus' time knew a ton about. And this might sound like I'm counter... Uh, contradicting myself, but I'm actually not. But if you ever heard the story of the rich young ruler... And basically, it's a man, he comes to Jesus one day, he wants to follow him. And when he gets to Jesus, the man goes, what, I, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And to answer the question, Jesus says this in Mark 10. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do, right? So he's coming at him kind of from the law, and you'll see Jesus give him the law back. Well, why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. So you're trying to draw him out. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. So that's what I mean. Jesus is giving him the law back right now. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, <laughs> the man, I, I did this, all these things since I was young. I'm in. And looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Ah, there's still one thing you haven't done, son. He told him, go sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And at this, the guy went away sad, for he had many possessions. Um, that's a powerful statement. I mean, he tells the guy to sell everything and give the money to the poor. But the response of the rich man tells us the most about him. Um, the Bible says he went away sad because he had many possessions. I wonder if we too have many possessions. I, you know, maybe the possessions aren't material things, like the rich man probably had to his name. Uh, maybe they're past things that we hold on to far too long and they don't fulfill us anymore. Or maybe they're habits that create more and more unhealthy rhythms in our lives. I, when I was down the shore, B.C., <laughs> I did get married. I was married for about a year and a half. Um, none of us knew the Lord at all, and then got divorced. Um, so now I started rebuilding myself, and I had the townhouse down there. And psh, I liked stereo equipment, so I got a Bang & Olufsen system on the downstairs, which was pretty cool at the time, and it hung on the wall a whole bit. And then upstairs... I guess I needed another stereo. I don't know what I was doing. I, I, I got a set of quads, and I had some audio research and that, and Nakamichi decks. And I mean, I maxed it out on audio equipment. And I was pretty happy with all that. Um, then I had a friend mirror some walls, and I brought in all this super high-end 80s furniture, modern furniture at the time. And then I bought a Porsche, 911. I had two Porsches, but I had a 911. I was driving around in a 911. And I'm thinking, I arrived. I didn't know the Lord. I'm thinking, wow, Chuck's got it going on now. <laughs> um, uh, Club Chuck. But when I received my second, and I'm only telling you this because these are things I let go of. When, and not that I had to. But when I received my second touch and reestablished that connection with God, it was very, very powerful. And, and my mainspring went into warp drive. And I just wanted to be used by God, and I was very open to where he was doing with me. And that's when the whole Israel thing happened. And I actually moved up to Bergen County. 
eight minutes from the church. So I rented out the townhouse. I put all my possessions in a storage unit. And I kind of did what the rich man did because I... <laughs> There was a kid that was just starting out, and I said, have I got a deal for you? And I gave him, you know, I sold him the storage unit, but for pennies on a dollar. Um, and I just kind of dumped everything, you know what I mean? And I did it one at a time, a little bit at a time. But I was so hungry to feed my spirit and learn. I went to every Bible study, every prayer meeting, you name it. And what I learned was, I'm not what I have or buy. <laughs> and I thought I was. My identity is in Christ and in Christ alone. You know, and I did leave the area because that's where God was moving me into another building project. Abraham left Ur, Moses left Egypt. And uh, I'm not saying a change of geography is for everybody, but that's what he was doing with me. Um, he orchestrated events that enabled me to let go of everything without even feeling it. Uh, seriously, I mean, it was just, I was just so in tune and excited about what God was doing. And I couldn't bring all that stuff with me. I mean, I went to a, <laughs> a two-story townhouse with a garage and all to living in a, a house with Jim Moyer, who sang in the Emmaus Road Band and also was our worship leader or sang on the worship team, but he grew up at the church. So the Lord put me with somebody that was kind of seasoned. Um, and I, like I said, I stopped there. Everything changed drastically. But Letting go of all that wasn't that hard. It, it just, it wasn't hard at all. It didn't mean anything to me anymore. And like I said, I sold everything for pennies on a dollar. I just, I went from living large to <laughs> living a lot larger in a different sense. You know, um, I never looked back. That's what I'm, I'm blessed for that because God was so, I just never looked back. And that brings me to the final point. Don't look back. That's a simple statement that could be a game changer. You know, don't look back at the things you've chosen to leave behind. It's the things you go back to that mess you up. Let that simmer. <laughs> you know, just like our other points today, there's a scriptural story that illustrates that beautifully. There was a man in the book of Genesis named Lot, and Lot had a wife, and they were fleeing the city from total destruction, and she decides to look back. We read it in Genesis 19, 26. But Lot's wife behind him looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. I mean, she was turned into a pillar of salt. <laughs> but the question isn't, well, why did she turn into a pillar of salt? The question that we should ask is, why did she look back? And the answer is revealed when you look deeper into the Hebrew word for looked, our English word looked. It actually means to regard something with favor, pleasure, or care. So Lot's wife was leaving the place she knew that she was comfortable with, and instead of them affecting the culture, the culture affected her, and she looked back as longing, and then boom, she fell under judgment of the same, the same city that God was destroying. Um, the Lord looked at the city, and he destroyed it because of constant disobedience, something you could read more about if you like. And I have to tell you, most people, I've had professors, scholarly professors say to me, Chuck, the Lord didn't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of homosexuality. And everybody says that because of the surface of the word. But they were notoriously sinful. Ezekiel tells us they had pride, excess of food, and everything else, and would not aid the poor. They wouldn't aid the needy. And the real sin was in hospitality. If someone, could, they would consider everybody outsiders, and if they came in that town, they would treat them terribly. They would degrade them, humiliate them, and the Lord just had enough of it. And that is the Dead Sea area where I was. And I, I mean, you guys have been there, right? It's, some of you. It's dead. <laughs> it, it's pretty dead. So when the Lord points something out that must be left behind, you got to be willing to leave it behind and never look back. God doesn't want us focused on what's behind us anyway. You know, I mean, there's no doubt he'll remind us on how far we've come, but the ultimate desire is that we fixate and focus on what's in front of us. You're, who you're becoming is more important than who you've been. That's another thing. Let that simmer down to you. I mean, again, it's the things we go back to that will hurt you. They will mess you up. In Isaiah 43, it's not on the screen because I edited it late last night. I couldn't sleep. <laughs> Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? 
I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I'll put that highway of holiness right through your wilderness for you. So as we finish up today, I know I gave you a lot to swallow. It's, I want to share a verse from the book of Philippians that highlights the importance of looking ahead. I used it the last time I was preaching. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do. Forget what lies behind. Strain forward what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul had quite a past he could have looked back on. He was probably one of the most intelligent people of his time. He spoke several different languages. Um, he was held in high honor and esteem among the Pharisees. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. So they all looked to him for the measuring gauge. You know, I mean, he studied on the Gamaliel, and he was an extremely gifted leader and celebrated for his thorough persecution of the early church. But Paul had to learn, as we do, to answer the call of God, deny ourselves, and move forward with the life that God has given us. You know, the best of life is yet to be. He has abundant life waiting for you and for me and for all of us. You know, so what's, what's holding you back today? What part of your past are you holding on to with a clenched fist? You know, and what are you afraid to let go of? FOMO? Fear of missing out? You know, I, I don't know. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You can't take it with you. You can send it on ahead. And like I said, it's not about, you know, God, it's not about, getting rid of your money, getting rid of all your possessions. I'm not talking about that. I think what it is, is in the beginning, he said, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. How does he do that? By getting you to focus on yourself. It's all about me, right? You, he gets you to focus on yourself, and that's where all the trouble starts. We're to think other people, we're to put others above ourselves and put others in front of ourselves and be humble and serve others. When we come to church... <sighs> I would love everybody to come in here and think, oh, man, who could I bless today? You know, do we ever think, hey, maybe, maybe I could park along the fence and let the older people and people that have trouble walking, let them get the good spots close to the church? I'm just, I'm just throwing a few things out there. Um, I, I, I love our people here, and I think you guys are awesome, and I really want us to get this because it's really important. I don't think church was made to just sit there on a Sunday and bless me today and, and not connect with God for the rest of the week and then come back in on the next Sunday and say, all right, I need another blessing. It was a tough week. You know, it's, Paul said by now, some of you should be teachers. You know, it's, get in there, get in there. In Philippians 2, verse 3, it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. There it is. I mean, so let's take some time this coming week and think introspectively about living all in for Jesus. And if you need help or counsel about it, please let us know. We're all in this together. Amen? Let's pray, guys. Lord, thank you for freeing us from sin and death and offering us abundant life instead. Help us to let go of our old ways of living and embrace all that you've generously given you know, David said, the Lord is my shepherd. He was looking to the Lord, not to everybody else. And he said, to behold the beauty, the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. David focused on looking at the Lord and his God. And Lord, we want to walk into a room and bring light into the room, <laughs> along with hope and truth also. And with the love of Christ, we want to bring grace and encouragement to our brothers and sisters. You told us we are the light of the world, Father, and a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. So may we ask ourselves what we bring in the room when we come. There's an old nature, you know, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, therefore anyone in Christ is a new creation, the old is gone, and the new has come. So that poison spirit of Adam, gone, and the Holy Spirit now takes up residence. So I think a lot of denying ourselves is that the Bible calls it the old nature, and it rears its ugly head from time to time. That's the thing I want to deny, because I don't like that guy. That Chuck is not, not a good guy. <laughs> I don't like that Chuck. We got to kill that Chuck. You know, I want the new Chuck that's walking in the Lord. And I want that for you guys too. 
Did everything make sense? This was a tough sermon today. Are we okay? You're not going to tar and feather me or anything? Okay. <laughs> so, Lord, just thank you again, and please, we want to be like you, Jesus. Um, fill us with your spirit. Help us, guide us, lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.